Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Arts Equator's Critics Live. I'm Matt Lyon and I host the theatre podcast at Arts Equator and teach theatre at the School of the Arts. Critics Live is part of the Asian Arts Media Roundtable and it's an open conversation which brings together critics from Southeast Asia, the US and the UK to engage with the works that have been presented as part of the Singapore International Festival of Arts. The production we'll be talking about today is, as I'm sure you know, Oiwa, The Ghost of Yotsuya, produced by Singapore's own finger players. The way this is going to work is that the four of us critics will discuss the play amongst ourselves for the first 40-ish minutes, and then for the remainder of the one-hour program, we'll take questions and comments from all of you, and you can post those comments either in Zoom chat or in the Facebook Live comment section, depending on the platform that you're watching us on. And of course, as I think you already know from the Zoom chat that I'm looking at, you don't have to wait to the end to start saying your piece, so free, feel free to type any time. The critics joining me this evening, or morning for some of them, are Amita Amranand, who has been a theatre critic since 2006. Her theatre reviews and articles regularly appear in the Bangkok Post. She currently sits on the artistic board of the Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting, BIPAM, and is the co-founder and co-host of Bangkok Offstage, the first bilingual podcast on the Bangkok performing arts scene. Thanks for joining us, Amita. Thank you. We also have Alice Saville, a London-based theatre critic, editor and writer. She's editor of Exeunt magazine, an online publication that specializes in experimental and long-form theatre criticism, where she writes regular columns. She also contributes freelance articles to publications including Time Out, Stage Door, The Stage, and The Financial Times. Hello, Alice. And we also have Taisuke Shimanuki, who is an art writer and editor born in 1980 and based in Tokyo and Kyoto. He writes and edits for art and culture magazines and websites such as Bijutsu Techo and Sinra.net, among others. His latest work was in the production and writing of a book related to Pratana, The Portrait of Possession, by the novelist Uti Hamamu, director Toshiki Okada of Cheltvich, and performed by Yuya Sukahara in Tokyo in June 2019. Hello, Taisuke. Yeah. Now, I'm the only one of us in Singapore, and so I'm the only one who watched the show live in the Victoria Theatre with everybody else seeing the uh, filmed version online, which of course I've also seen. I'm pretty sure most of the people watching have also seen the show either in person or online, otherwise why are you here? But maybe you're here because you love watching us all talk. In that case, a quick reminder, Oiwa is a retelling of a traditional Japanese ghost story in which a jilted wife haunts her money-grabbing husband for his many transgressions. And it was staged in a very interesting way, with masked human actors pretending to be inanimate puppets, which are then brought to life by black-clad, semi-invisible puppeteers standing behind them. It's not something you see very often, I think. We're going to begin the discussion proper by asking Taisuke to tell us about the origins of the Oiwa story in Japanese folklore and what changes playwright Chong Tzu Chien has made in his retelling. Now, Taisuke will be speaking in Japanese, so assuming you're watching us on Zoom and need an English translation, then if you roll over the bottom of your Zoom screen where the bar appears, you'll see an interpretation button and you should select English. And then, fingers crossed, you will hear an English translation whenever Taisuke speaks. Also, if you'd like to read subtitles of what we're saying, you can turn on the closed captions feature in much the same way. And if you run into trouble with any of this, please ask a question in chat and our tech team will support you. Okay, so with all that out of the way, Taisuke, how did this production of Oiwa relate to the original story? Hi, Matt, Thank you, Matt. The title of this a production is Oiwa. In Japan, it's called the ghost story of Yotsuya. And it's it's a very popular production, not only for performing arts audience, for general public, it's a very uh, familiarized horror st story. This uh, production Oiwa, for me Jap uh, as a Japanese, it's a very spectacular, entertain, strong entertainment production. Of course, there are some scary aspects 
too, but in Japan, it's more like a chic, subtle kind of horror production or more abstract production. Productions are more popular. Uh, but in Japan, there are varieties of stories of Oiva. So let me briefly explain the original story of Oiva. So in this production, the Tamiya is the main character. Tamiya and Oiva are a husband and food, samurai husband and, and his wife. But Tamiya is such a bad person and descri uh, described as a villain. He falls in love with someone else. And the boy the, born between Tamiya and Oiwa, the boy was born. However, after giving birth, Oiwa gets, uh, becomes ill. And that distances two of them. And meanwhile, Tamiya falls in love with someone else and kills Oiwa. So the focus is on the relationship between Tamiya and Oiwa. However, the finger players Oiwa, the location is very different. Different characters, villages, they are all haunted. So the haunting is spreading. So it's more modern horror story, I would say. In terms of performance and the context, uh, I would like, uh, instead of uh, context, I would like to focus on uh, the, the storyline. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have this story of villainy, which it seems in the Singapore production uh, has become even more horrific with maybe even more supernatural elements and more haunting going on. It, it kind of seemed to me that that haunting was a way of spreading the particular type of a vill villainy and making it seem omnipresent, just like you might get in Shakespeare. Um, Amita, the themes that contributed to that villainy and, and, and amplified the, the supernatural uh, elements, what, what do you have to say about uh, the, the thematic content? Um, I felt, I feel like the, the haunting sort of came, yeah, I, when I was um, watching, I didn't feel like that interested in the haunting itself. I mm. felt like that was part of the story, but, and in a, in a way, I was kind of waiting for the ring part because, um, you know, when she, <laughs> if, if anyone's watching the ring, and of course I was intrigued by the part when sometimes when she speaks about, when she speaks and there's another voice that um, Tamiya hears and, and, and all of that, but I, I'm not sure I figured those, all those things out exactly. And I felt like if the, the whole thing was more about um, uh, how she became a ghost, how she be, rather than, um, yeah, yeah, I think the more of the, most of the story is more focused on that. And I feel like, but I went back and because Taisuke told us last time uh, when we were talking last time that this is so different. And I went back and looked at the, at what the, how the plot, you know, unfolds in the original. I, it was on Wikipedia, so I'm not sure whether that's original because I understand that it's been adapted uh, so many times and there's so many subplots. And in some, in some versions, I read that it's not, there's not even haunting um, in it. There's not even a ghost element in it. Um, so given how different it is from the original story, I feel like this is very interesting in, in terms of how it explores the theme of class and, um, and you know, class relations and um, one sense of self and how it, that informs one's relationship to wealth and one class identity and how that kind of informs one, the way one see the other. And, um, and like we said the other day, it's very Macbethian. And I think the, the, the director and the, the playwright also said that when he discovers uh, the, the story, he feels like, oh, this is like the Japanese Macbeth as well in an interview. Um, and, uh, you know, they're the ruthless, uh, murderous greed of <laughs> Tamiya. And, um, and I feel like the play attempts to tell the story from two perspectives, like a he said, she said from the beginning. It's like, you know, he's like, oh, this ghost who tricked me into the marriage, my, my wife who tricks me into this terrible marriage. And then she, he's, and she's like, no, never believe the, the story of, uh, of men. But I'll come back to that a little bit later and how I have a bit of a problem. I think it's a very difficult story 
like because it's so detailed, it's a very difficult story to tell in a short period of time from two perspectives and get really both uh, perspectives fairly and equally. Um, and Tamiya himself, he's such a fascinating character for me. Um, he started off as a real victim. He was beaten by, by his father, but then he quickly descends into this terrible human being, very cruel and completely consumed by his greed. And as the play progresses, he never shakes that perception of himself as a victim. And because of the thing of his class uh, background compared to OUS family's class. And um, there's a very revealing scene, I think, after Oyua has told him, after they were married and Oyua told him that there's more gold than what she had shown him. And I was like, oh, now he's going to go tell his best friend about there's even more to it and how are we going to get this? But instead, he said, he confided in his best friend and said, look at these people. There's so much secret in this family. And he felt just so resentful of why of why he's not privy to this, that he feels he never truly belongs. And I feel in the end, he never, like to them, he's always the poor man or the outsider and undeserving man. And in the end, he blames Oiwa and her family for his demise as well. And saying that this is, you know, this has always been the war against the rich, um, you know, the rich and the poor, the rich against the poor. And, um, you know, and the beginning too, he said he was tricked into this marriage. This marriage became a bondage to him. He kind of blames everything on, on her and he even though he totally covets that wealth that wealth and he exploited the kind of guilt that the typical of upper middle class or typical rich people like she, he made her work he made her do these charitable things he made her work and and she felt good about it she feel like she needs to sacrifice to kind of like you know make up or overcompensate for this wealth she she did she feels she didn't deserve or something because it was built by her it became from her father and it didn't even come exactly from her father. Her father kind of found it accidentally. Um, but it, it comes to greed. If we, I mean, he's obviously the most, the greediest, but I owe and her father also has certain kind of greed and they kind of covet things that are in, in some destructive way too. They kind of covet things that, um, that they f probably feel never belong to them. Tamiya, I think, first covered something that not as simple as material wealth, but rather a sense of power, status, and acceptance that he felt, oh, this can belong to him if he marries into this very rich family. Um, I think her, cover, her father, for example, covets praise, praise and gratitude from the villagers, and he created this moral competition, this thing called the daily honor roll among the villagers, right, and in which he honors good deeds to the villagers, but they're they're like silly good deeds, like, oh, so-and-so climbs up um, to help a cat, um, and so-and-so, um, oh, yeah, impregnated his wife, um, you know, their ninth children, so go and congratulate him, but in a way, he's rigged it in a way that would favor his type of good deeds in the end, which is the kind that only wealthy can truly give, which is the charitable kind of um, good deed. And, uh, you know, so he treats the village as his charity case, which means he has to give only so much for people to be happy, but not so much that they no longer need this harvest because there's this annual harvest that this his entire family gives every year. Um, and and Oiwa, she uh, covets Tamiya's love, right? She asks him to marry her after her sister dies, um, knowing that he has never loved her and uh, and in a way, all these relationships, all these main relationships in the play are very transactional. Owe's family and the village, very transactional. Owewa and Tamiya, like her father who, you know, buys her respect from the villagers through the harvest, through this honor roll game. She buys love from Tamiya, perhaps not intentionally, but uh, she gives him access to her wealth in return for, um, you know, marriage to him. Um, and like I said earlier, I feel like the stories didn't do so much, uh, didn't, I, in general, I really loved the play and uh, the whole production and the storytelling, but my problem was that the writing at the end, when Tamiya is haunted by Uwiwa's goat and says to her that it has always been about the rich against the poor, and she says suddenly, no, this is not what this is about, it's about w men against women, and uh, I feel like, I was like, so is that... In, at that part, I was, I, I was kind of thrown off and I was like, wait, is that the playwright wanting to say that, um, is that play, the playwright wanting to say that this is the OUS pers uh, perspective? Because I never felt that was the case throughout the play. Um, but 
or is it the playwright's attempt to be like, oh, by the way, we kind of want to address this issue of uh, men against women or the gender issue, but it never kind of occurs. So we kind of stuff it in there, um, you know, to say that, oh, it's also about this. It's about this gender gender uh, war. And um, and I feel like the only gender issue, I was kind of like, what if we could do a, like a gender swap thing? And then I realized, oh my God, this may be the only gender thing that that could be explored that could be interesting is that they kind of flip the gold digger trope on its head you know he's literally almost a gold like the gold digger in this story yes i i also thought that um that the the male female dynamic came in rather unexpectedly and i wasn't exactly convinced to learn that that was what it was supposed to be all about i mean i guess there's also the idea that it was a time of even greater male privilege where the man is the one who will inherit and and, and marrying kind of makes him the new patriarch but i just read that as part of the period rather than something it was trying to explore and it, it did really seem to be exploring class as you say and, and wealth differences more than anything else what interested me is that uh, both you and Taisuke talked about the villainy of this guy and how he goes on this Macbeth-like journey from, well, you know, Macbeth arguably goes from good to bad, whereas as Tamiya kind of goes from, from bad to worse to worse to worse to, oh my God. But what was fascinating for me there is that there are only three human human actors playing humans. Um, uh, three characters where that applies and and he's the main one of them who's on stage for the most part um, and nearly all of the people he interacts with are the humans acting as puppets and please ignore I should never do that I should never do that it does not look good um, and being puppeteered by the people in black as we said and that for me made it made him more sympathetic because we see him up against, you know, these hard jointed kind of wooden looking creatures which we have to imbue with life and which have a very vivid form of life to them, but it's also constrained and limited, amplified in one direction. It doesn't have the range um, of a standard human performance who's able to communicate with their eyes. And so it was I, about halfway through, I found myself realizing he is absolutely unredeemedly evil. Why do I like him? And it was a little bit of a kind of a Tony Soprano moment. Tony Soprano kills someone and you're like, why am I rooting for this guy? And I think that that was partially accomplished through this very unique aesthetic, which we're seeing pictures of now. And I don't know what your screen quality is like at home if you didn't see the show, but hopefully you can see the bump over the, the woman in white Oiwa's head there. Um, and that's, that's somebody manipulating her at the back. I'll just talk a little bit about the, the puppetry generally before we before we go to Alice. And I think the finger players have been uh, fascinated with this idea of humans being puppets uh, for a long time. And it's it's such a strange aesthetic, but way back, I remember seeing a production called uh, I'm Just a Piano Teacher, which was written and directed by Oliver Chong, one of... Uh, Zetian's peers, obviously, at the, the finger players. And he had humans with very strong kind of Beijing opera style makeup, wearing puppet bodies around their necks and manipulating those puppet bodies. And in order to make the actual puppet bodies aesthetically match with the face, the facial performances became, again, very vivid, but very constrained in what they would do, almost as if you're very conscious of where the joints in your face are and how much you can manipulate them. So facial expressions became extremely amplified. I found that very successful. The next time they tried it, though, it was, it was much less so. Uh, that was a production called Pinocchio's Complex, where they had a, a human performer acting as a puppet, but she wasn't puppeteered by anyone. She was just acting of her own volition. And it didn't work at all. And at the time I theorized it was because when we see a masked performance or we see a puppet performance, we know, 
you know, we know we're looking at something inanimate, but we also recognize the striving of the performer, the puppeteer or the wearer of the mask. We recognize that they want to imbue it with life. And so as an audience member, we go with that and we see the life in it. On the other hand, I thought at the time that if we see a human acting inanimate, then equally we go with that intention and we start seeing that the human performer is lifeless and uninteresting. So I thought that it was, you know, having a human act full body as a puppet, um, I thought that was never going to work. But then a production called uh, Shun Kin came to Singapore, where we saw this manipulation of a human body, this puppeteering of it, and it was incredibly effective. And it, it's, it, it has this uncanny valley kind of look, which is haunting in itself and pulls you in and makes you question who are the figures that are puppeteering us in real life. And I think it boils down to the idea that you need if you're going to act as a puppet, you can't do it with your own volition and your impulses. I think you maybe need to channel somebody else's impulses. So the puppeteers at the back, often they just had like one hand on the puppet actor's back and maybe another hand on their arm to help them gesture. But of course, it's still the case that the human puppet is doing a lot of the work. That is not enough to control a whole body. But it appears that the impulse is able to create that sense that this is an inanimate object which wants to come to life and the audience goes with that idea. Indeed, the only times I found it unconvincing was there was a clump of three, a kind of a chorus of three characters who traveled around sometimes on stage and made announcements. And often the puppeteer would only have the hand on one of them and the other two were still acting. And at that point, it didn't look right. It didn't look right for me, it was very odd. Of course, the design for this entire production is quite spectacular. I was lucky enough to see it in person. So the puppets, are part of that, the mask, the beautiful costumes. Um, Alice, uh, do you have anything to say about the design and I guess as well how it looked on uh, on screen? I guess my expectation sort of before I came to this production was that it would be sort of really visually impressive because it's something with such a rich visual tradition. And I think, yeah, the sense of the that what came across on the screen, I'm not sure what it was like in the space, was this he, this very sort of natural environment, this huge sort of forest of uh, sort of bamboo reaching right up to the heavens. Um, and I thought that sort of snippet initial scene you got with this sort of cascade of thunder and sound was really exciting in terms of immersing you in this space and the sense that maybe this is quite a small, vulnerable community um, surrounded by the elements where life is quite precarious, which is perhaps why the village has got locked into these really unhealthy and strange dynamics, because, because this is a place where it's tough to survive. And yeah, sort of this sense of like shafts of light coming through the, coming through the wood, I found it really exciting. And I think that was something, there was a moment that it sort of clicked for me when they, when they mentioned this idea that... Um, the, the compound was built on all the bodies of, um, of, of, of sort of victims and their gold. So the idea that this is really a, a very cursed and dark place that everyone's inhabiting. Um, I mean, I think that theatre design is always incredibly hard to capture on camera because it's obviously it's not the medium it's designed for. Um, and I think that actually non-naturalistic and very stylized designs like the kind we see here work so much better because you're not kind of looking for the edges if you see what I mean mm. um like it's it's you're accepting this as a created artistic environment um so yeah I found that really effective but I think that it is nonetheless kind of hard to capture the full sort of overwhelming sense of being in the theatre. I mean, something this production did, which I thought was really interesting, which I've never encountered before, is the idea of being able to choose three different camera views. Um, and I think that did a lot in terms of creating a sense of liveness because, um, you know, just as in the theatre, your eye can kind of freely travel around the stage. You can choose what you want to focus on. I think you sort of got a bit closer to that. Um, but, but I think that 
it's like I'm kind of interested in the potential of what would happen if you took that further like because sometimes I found myself really wanting to look at a particular performer closely like really wanting to see their face so I'm kind of imagining what if you had what if you had loads of camera angles and you had some that were really close up on particular performers so you could follow them through the action but then also there's maybe an argument that like if you're sort of almost being the film director of your own experience you're choosing your angle it maybe almost takes you out of the moment and out of the liveness of the experience because suddenly you're thinking wow I'm gonna toggle between this view and this view and um this this story is so incredibly fast moving that you have to be following it really closely otherwise you'll miss a really important moment and I guess that was something I maybe wasn't expecting I think that when I've seen sort of this kind of stylized puppet performance in the past maybe there's been a sense that there's more breathing room in the story there are more moments which are more about pure atmosphere and you can take in the kind of emotional resonance of what you've seen whereas it felt maybe that you know like the each death would happen so fast and suddenly we were on to the we were on to the next stage it almost reminds me of um flicking through a comic book you know when you're sort of reading all the panels really fast and you're you're kind of sucked in but none of it emotionally lands um I mean I, I really agreed with what you were saying Amita earlier about the sense that you kind of expect this to be always story and um and you don't actually see much of her perspective here and I think that's that's maybe something to do with the lack of space in the story because um you don't really have a sense to send sort of time to appreciate the suffering she goes through and I think also because um you don't sort of you, you don't have that sense of her having facial mobility and sort of she's she she's almost like a symbol like when you first meet her all you can see is this black straggly hair right over her face she's hunched over she's almost like a comical figure you meet her and her sister and they're kind of giggling in this almost quite stereotypical young girl way and then as she sort of gains in confidence she's convinced she's loved you, you, you do sort of see a bit more of her face but you don't really get her perspective and, and yeah I am kind of interested in that in that choice that was made to have Tamiya played sort of more by a human actor and to have her taking the more um, puppetry approach um, but yeah, I guess that's something I've been thinking a lot about in various forms is this idea of um, liveness and how you can translate it on the screen and what, what, what benefits you get from seeing a filmed piece of performance and what, what makes that different from a film. And yeah, I'd never seen a film puppetry performance before. And I think in a way, seeing it on screen really drew my attention to um, the artifice and the layers of effort that had gone into creating it. I think that maybe instead of being sort of sometimes fully transported um, and, and sort of relating to each of these characters, I, I maybe sort of was looking, I was looking at the scenes and thinking about the effort that went into creating each scene. Um, yeah, which, which which is kind of exciting, but um mm. Yeah, I, I found myself almost, I feel like I almost would have been excited to see the actors doing more to acknowledge and play with the artifice of the devices they were using. I found myself thinking of something that um, there's a director called Emma Rice who does a lot to sort of play with the idea of how you, sta how you stage films um, uh, on stage and how you create really complex technical effects without faking or without pretending. So for example, if a character is going to fly, you see the strings come down, they clip the ropes to themselves in a very conscious, acknowledged way and soar across the stage. So yeah, I think maybe there were moments where I almost wanted to see, I wanted to see the artifice be acknowledged and kind of broken down a little bit. Yeah. But, but but also, yeah, I think it has a real, it did, it did have real power in, in the form we watched it in. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because obviously I saw it live as well. And you do get 
more immersed watching it live. Although you're sitting in the darkness, those incredibly high contrast streams of light that were put all over the stage really seem to surround you. And when you're looking at a screen, it's so flatly presented. Fair enough, it was a very 2D presentational performance, deliberately so. But it flattens out so much in the screen that I did find my eye wandering to the to the CIFA logo in the top right, which was bright white and they didn't put any opacity, they didn't put any transparency on. So it was it was all the way through. And then you've got the the numbered cameras that you can choose from at the top. And then, and yes, you do also, I think when you're investigating that, also want to investigate the artifice of the performance. And, and you can yourself, as you said, curate your own performance. How did you respond to that, Amita, the, the idea of curating your own performance there? I was really excited. I was like, oh, I haven't seen this done before. You know, I've, I've, I've seen quite a few um, online performances already in different format, like sometimes live recording, sometimes not, and or sometimes really set up. And this one, but I, I don't know whether Alice or everyone else had the same experience where I, when I try to click on, on the, the ca different cameras, they just kind of stop. Right? Like yep. it just goes, goes to like black. And then, okay, so second. it's everyone's experience. So, yeah. And one thing, maybe I'm spoiled, but in some, you know, in some festivals and some shows, you can, you kind of can go back and forth. Like you can go, I couldn't, and I don't know. I just don't, I know it's less live when you do that, of course. And, um, but at the same time, as a critic or something, it's really good. It's, it's really, um, you know, practical and it's really useful to be able to do that. But of course it, it's not going to feel as live. And yeah, I, it just became distracting. So I kind of stopped, except, you know, once in a while, I would just go to camera three or one of the cameras to kind of like change a little bit of perspective. And I don't think it changed the perspective that much. I thought we would be able to see from above or something like that. And it just, yeah, it's a good um, sort of experience to think about, like, uh, you know, but it, for the, for future, but I, it just hasn't, it's, it's not working that well yet, or it's not that successful yet. Mm. Yeah, I I must admit, I, I found the same and, and probably more so. I found it really quite problematic. Uh, certainly going black for a second and losing the audio before you get the change was a bit of a big problem. Yeah. And it taking up so much room on the screen was a problem. And as you say, the cameras were not vast. One of them was a lot closer than the others. Yeah. But the other two were actually just basically front and center Quite with similar. one just a little bit lower down. So there was really yeah. little point in changing from camera one to camera two. And yet camera three felt like it had been filmed by somebody who didn't know the play that well. It was closer up, but it sometimes just missed the relevant point and it wasn't done with a zoom lens so they couldn't reframe. I, I would have greatly preferred someone to curate that for me because already mm -hmm. I think the screen experience, as, as Alice suggested, takes you out a little bit. And then having to do your own editing work, I mean, come on, pay someone to do that, is, is, is my opinion <laughs> on that one. If it were a lot smoother, maybe if it didn't take up room on the screen and it just worked instinctively, I can see it being interesting. But even then, I think, I think we lose so much when we go to screen that for me, the, the, the way is to say we can't win the theater game, but maybe we can start scoring some points in the film game and just choose the very best angles. I don't know. Nonetheless, it did. I think it, it was a, a high quality recording where you could always see what was going on and it's streaming. So it's, you know, it's probably not Blu-ray level or anything like that, but not too bad. And it was able to show off some some absolutely beautiful design and and performance techniques that apparently are somewhat inherited from Japanese traditions. Um, will I try and pronounce them? Kabuki and then another one. I'm going to let uh, Taisuki tell us about those, please. So this the, the switching of the screen, I think any angle was uh, set in an objective way, so you can watch the screen in a neutral way. There was some kind of frustration 
But with that frustration, we can focus on the movements of particular actors. So I think in that sense, using the toggle can be an interesting feature. And let's move on to the uh, puppets. Puppet theater or mask theater, the interesting thing is that there is the character and the physicality, the double physicality, I would say. And to feel that, the actors and the audience has to share the same, has to share the space and time. And that can be something difficult uh, in online. However, in regards to OIVA, physicality or the, the multiple personalities are not so important. That's my impression in a negative way. But in a positive way, I think we are going back to the topic we were discussing at the beginning of this uh, discussion. I think the original story of the ghost, uh, Yotsi, ghost of Yotsuya had something to do with the multiple personality. The basic story of the uh, ghost story of Yotsuya is um, the murder case uh, caused by grudge between men and women. The original story was developed by Nambo Kutsuria. And back then, the scenes from the ghost story of Yotsuya were performed alternately with other production. So in total, they spent two days to perform those two performances. The other production is called Chushingura. This story is more popular and famous uh, in Japan. Let me briefly explain the story of Chushingura. There's uh, two uh, areas governed by feudal lords. The powerful feudal lord was treating the other feudal lord very poorly. And one day, the feudal lord who was being treated poorly got really upset and swung his sword and injured him. And as a result, the whole area was destroyed. And the retainers of that feudal lord established an army to take revenge on the powerful feudal lord. So that's the basic story of Chushingura. The ghost story of Yotsuya took place in the same era. So it's it's like a side story of Chushingura. So the reason why they performed those two productions at the same time is because one, to gain more audience because Chushingura was very popular, but also it really shows the samurai society, like bureaucratic society. And however, the ghost story of Yotsuya is more civic society. And so you can see, you can compare those two societies. And I think that's a, a thinking behind those two performances together. The Hayashi family, that's uh, the family that Oiwa belongs to, in the original story, the this family isn't a wealthy family. So the reason why the finger players focused on the wealth, I think it's a strategy for them to sort of criticize this structure of wealth and poor, mm. to have some critical viewpoint of the current society. So this production maybe refers to the modern history of Singapore or Southeast Asia, perhaps, where yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, re the relationship between poor and the uh, rich. I think that was very interesting. Yes, and to me, despite the aesthetic, which is so obviously traditional, it may be innovative in the, you know, in the way that the human puppetry was handled, but the aesthetic so traditional, but it did really feel feel quite up to date in, in what it was saying, at least in the in the critique of, of class. Um, shall we, since we've had about 40 minutes of this, shall we go to some questions? I believe they will magically appear. We have from Max. I feel puppetry is an interesting form to tell this story as it turns the stage into a giant puppet show stage where we have to use our imagination to fill in the gaps. Did any of you feel yourselves filling in those gaps and, and kind of mentally painting the stage? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll start a little bit like that. 
in the theater, I think we got a little bit more of a sense, obviously much more of a sense of the 3D and the depth, especially if you were watching, I think it was camera two, your eyes were absolutely level with the floor so that when people moved away from you, they didn't appear to move away. They just appeared to get smaller, um, which was an interesting effect. But obviously seeing it live, I was aware of this kind of cavernous stage, which is so often essentially painted black and just interrupted by very, very focused bright beams of light. And it did make you often imagine what's going to just step out into the light quite a lot of the time. It was, it was very much a proposition of you're either brightly lit and incredibly present or you're not there at all. And that really facilitated kind of suspense and shock tactics and made me imagine things that weren't even there a lot of the time. Does anybody else have a, uh, any thoughts about that? So, let me say a few words. To Kabuki, for example, there are some methods where an uh, actor plays a puppet and human at the same time. It's called the Ningyoburi technique. What's unique about this is the actor who plays the role. However, all of a sudden, without any clue, that same person starts acting a puppet and then go back to a human. So historically, it's not the mainstream. It's not authentic, according to the Japanese history of kabuki or traditional performing arts. And I think that's because in performing arts, it is important to know that what kind of illusion the actors can provide to audience. And, and also, the culturally, the audience can share that kind of thinking. So in that light, the method that used in Oiwa uh, influenced the La Theatre du Soleil and brushed up the traditional form of puppet theater. So it's more like real, real actors' performance. That's how I felt. So I felt that uh, that was something uh, that could have been considered lacking. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Taisuke. Um, we, can we have another question, please? It appears. I like being able to flick the cams, but my one issue was that you can't pause it. Somehow watching on a screen, I need breaks in a way that I don't with live shows. Yeah, I, we, we mentioned that a little bit earlier, but maybe we can flesh it out. Is there, is there any reason you can think of that we shouldn't be able to pause in our own homes? We should, too. Totally we should. Well, either way, I mean, you know, wh whichever side of that argument you're on, I've, I've prejudiced it, obviously. I think it's stupid, but um, maybe you can persuade me otherwise. I think we live, we, we can't deny the fact that it, it's such, yeah, it's annoying. Actually, it annoys me every time I have to like watch something like live online, especially like it's just been like this for, for over a year and it's just, yeah, and we can't deny the fact that we're we're sitting in a totally different reality at home. Like, I was watching this video on like the the, the designers of Oiwa, and at one point the the sound designer who was like, "Oh, we're like the second class citizen because visual comes first. And and I was just like, "Yeah, like I don't get the atmosphere, you know, when when you do these things, and it's it really robs up of, of a lot of things. But so when you're on, but yeah, like. I get I get distracted way easier. My behavior is totally different when I'm at home watching because I would never pull up a phone when I'm bored. You know, um, in, in the middle of the during when I'm at the theater, I would never. I don't know if I'm hungry, then I just try to ignore that feeling. Whereas I'm at home, I'm like, what can I eat? Or when I need to go to the bathroom, I'm like, well, I have to hold it in. You know, like you, you your your body totally reacts differently. Um, to this thing in front of you it's just so two-dimensional you and you have like with all this technology now like there's so many things to distract you and like at home too like maybe you have other things to distract you at home you're yeah, you're not in the same space with you know, you're in two totally two totally different realities two totally different spaces you're not with the atmosphere of what's going on on stage at all so yeah, yeah, I would prefer, as a critic as well, I prefer to be able to take notes. And like um, Alice said, it, I did notice the 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 rhythm of the how fast it went and how like you never 
and it would be so much nicer. I don't know whether when they designed, they knew that they they would have to be stream live as well. So maybe they didn't think of like creating, like, you know, slowing things down mm. and creating more of an atmosphere um, in a filmic sense as well. Um, so I feel like, yeah, I realized that maybe it could have been more atmospheric in a way for, for us at home. If I don't know whether when they designed, they had that in mind or they thought this is going to be only live. We're not going to stream it because maybe by that time, um, we're gonna, you know, all be back in the theater or something. Yeah. Did it did it contribute to the to the liveness for you, Alice? That that not being able to pause it and the idea, I suppose, that we're going to create this atmosphere in your own home. Well, I feel like there's a bit of a paradox sometimes where when you're watching live streams, you get the worst aspects of liveness, but not the mm. good ones. So <laughs> like the most annoying aspect of liveness is that you're like trapped here, you have to do it now, you can't go to the toilet or, you know, you've got that, but you haven't got the good aspect of liveness, which is the response of the audience, um, the energy the sense of occasion and events. Um, I mean, I'm kind of, I am interested in how you can create that sense of specialness and occasion at home. Something that I've been doing with my flatmates since the pandemic is we watch theatre live streams together. We have a meal beforehand. We turn off all the lights. We're not allowed to look at our phones. We're not allowed to talk. We just have to super focus. And we did an Angels in America day like that, where we watched the whole seven hours um, in the dark in the living room it helps that it was like snowing outside so it wasn't like a beautiful sunny day that we were missing out on but but I think that you can invest in that experience um and here I think I hear I feel like it was a middle ground because as you said earlier Matt the fact you had the logo and the toggles meant that you couldn't do that sort of full I'm going to try and make a mental leap into this world um but at the same time it didn't let you pause and sort of you know, go and be a human in the way that human beings are in their home. So yeah, it was like a weird middle ground for me. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, Zerchen did a, a play last year called Murder at Mandai Camp, which also you couldn't pause, but for the very good reason that it also, you had to go on Telegram and there was a live chat that kind of supported and interacted with the uh, with with the show that you were watching, which was a murder mystery. And so when there's that level of, you, you mentioned having a meal with your friends, but yeah, when there's that level of community, I can absolutely see the point to get it through. But just looking at chat, there's all people saying, yeah, what if I want to go to the toilet? All it takes for my mother to, is to innocently knock on my door and ask how to forward a message on WhatsApp, huh? And I forget entirely what transpired so far in the show. Yeah, you can't control, you'd think you'd be able to control your own homes, right? But they're far less controllable environments than the theater. So when you don't give us the opportunity to pause, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go to a, uh, another question. It may be one of the last couple, I think. What is the value or implication of staging a play that is so straightforwardly centered on a male Machiavellian protagonist today? I enjoyed it aesthetically, but viewing this piece of work through a feminist lens, I felt very let down. So uh, let's go to either Alice or Amita on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I kind of, I had this very much a preconception coming to the work that it was going to be all about this kind of vengeful twisted feminist icon I was kind of thinking of you know classic stories like Medea where you have the female anti-hero um and yeah I, I feel like that yeah I, I do agree that it wasn't it wasn't that it wasn't perhaps what you were led to expect from from the title um and and I think that and I think that's a shame in a way because I think that we're kind of at a moment where we are looking looking for stories with re stories from the past with really strong female characters. And I think sometimes there's this perception that, you know, writing interesting female characters is happening, is something that's happened more recently and in the past that we don't have those models. But actually I think there are, you know, myth and legends are full of these really complex, weird, dark women. And this seems like one of those examples. So it's kind of a shame that we didn't perhaps get the richness of that. I think I'm kind of also interested in the humor of the story because I think I kind of, I wasn't, I think it was it was quite jolting. Like in the very first scene, you have the, you know, the the man and his apprentice in the forest. And when they, um, 
when they both wet themselves because of the ghost and he had the joke about sort of being a virgin, I was like, oh, okay, this really isn't what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting it to be kind of funny and a bit tongue in cheek. And I think I, I really enjoyed that because it does it does make that world more accessible in a way. It's sort of, um, it, it does kind of humanize those people, but at the same time, I kind of wonder what it would be like if Oiwa kind of was also able to make jokes or what if she was a complex character who was able to kind of express her own level of fear and doubt and yeah because because her trajectory is so interesting but you don't see it from inside you see it more from sort of outside and how she transforms in the eyes of those around her. Amita your thoughts on that? I wouldn't say I was disappointed, but I was just a little bit surprised that um, the story was a bit more focused. But I was quite, you know, engaged in the story. It was, it was so, it was so, it was such an interesting story. But at the same time, yeah, it was just weird that, or maybe they, yeah, maybe in the writing, yeah, it just my biggest problem was when they kind of st- try to stuff it in at the end. It was like, no, this is about women and men, and it was just like, no, you didn't you didn't do that at all. I wouldn't say I was disappointed by by the fact that it was less feminist than less feminist than expected. Mm. I just I just didn't feel like she was that interesting of a character. Um, I was fascinated by the fact that nobody like there was no real face scene, like even the the mask, they were either masked or just like, even to me, I was com- almost completely covered. You never see real faces and I thought that was that was interesting that you never really see one of my theories was that maybe they wanted to explain why she came out of you know she became a ghost with um with hair that's covered um her face to begin with so that's why they always do it you know that's why even when she was living they they cover her face that way or it's maybe like like Alice said earlier, she's more of a symbol of this weak, uh, submissive kind of character. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know. But then, like when you look back at the images of Oiwa from, uh, from like paintings and all that, she, her, she was a bit bald, and she, um, you can see her face, right? Like and all of that. So I don't know. I, I, I would say I was intrigued. I don't know why they they made that choice with Oiwa. Yeah, I think I was eventually a little bit disappointed by it, although for a long time I wasn't really thinking in those terms, because as we discussed earlier, I wasn't really even thinking it was about gender relations. But when that started being mentioned, and especially when she had the scene where she basically wasted away for 15 minutes because she was no longer beautiful after being burned, I did start thinking that this is a rather retrograde thing to do, especially in a story where her name is uh, is on the billboard. And it just made me start noticing that we saw that picture. Maybe we can get it up again. The picture of Oiwa, where she looks like she's a, you know, she's a blank white canvas with ink running down it, essentially. And she doesn't really have her own character. She seems to be about, you know, with the main character being Tamiya there. And, and and having so much of the, um, the, taking so many of the actions in the play, it really does seem to be him projected on her in a way that seems old fashioned. Possibly the play thought it was questioning that, but I'm not sure if I saw enough agency from her or even enough necessarily critique of her lack of agency to be able to think of it as anything other than a somewhat old fashioned story. I think she does have a lot of agency. That's why I was kind of annoyed that at the end she said, no, this is about men and women. And it was just like, mm. you kind of consent to a lot of things that were terrible for you. So, you know, <laughs> so, this I don't see why. Like, she, she suddenly saw herself as a victim when she totally made all those choices herself. So I, I don't think it was about agency or or submission. Okay, yeah. interesting. I'm, I I read it, perhaps incorrectly, as her feeling she had to play that submissive role, um, possibly because her, her of the choice. gender. Her choice, yeah. Yeah, but maybe I think I read it that her choice was influenced by her circumstances, as people's are. I don't know. Mm. It's, it's but then a, don't forget her sister was totally different. Well, and yes, they killed her true. off, uh, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. All right, shall we go to one final question? Do you feel the horror was more impro- more appropriate for the stage more so than for the screen? 
since the stage magic was a huge part of the production and the horror for the screen has its own genre conventions. What are your thoughts on the stage magic too? Well, having seen it live, I should probably lead on that one. And uh, I was never at any point scared, um, but I don't really get scared by such things. I do get entertained by them. I often think that horror in the theater, even when it's done really well, is something like you get a jump scare and then everybody in the audience laughs. And they're not necessarily laughing because they found it funny, but rather because of a release of tension. But then that laughter kind of gets read sometimes by the audience as it's funny. And I just find it self undercutting of the horror experience. But oddly enough in the Victoria theater this time, because we were so spread out, there wasn't that critical mass of humanity which can result in laughter. So it was a far more stiller and more silent and more contemplative experience. And maybe that let the horror in a little bit more for some people, I'm not sure, but it was more about entertainment than horror for me. Uh, what about the rest of you? Did you find it scary and, and did that matter? The, the feel to describe the fear on the stage can be quite difficult. I think uh, it should be immersive experience in that case. And from the context of the question, Oiwa, just like the ring, Oiwa has a very strong feature of Japanese horror. About 10 to 20 years ago, Japanese horror started booming. And in that, the female ghost or female vicious spirits are uh, somewhat the strong feature of Japanese horror. And it can be somewhat typical. And that's what I saw when I first started watching Japanese horror. And Oiwa is very typical of that. So rather than feminism or gender, it's more about society or class. Or, you know, the Oiwa was combing her hair and she started talking about the citizen class where she said, we can't maintain our reputation without having the uh, respect from the general public. It's almost like uh, influencers in, in, on Instagram. So I thought it's criticized, it's depicting the uh, populism or social influences or through female identity. I, I think it is not well done in terms of showing the female identity. Oh, thank you. Um, Amita, let's, uh, let's finish up with the point that uh, you were going to make. Oh, I just said, um, I, it was important for me to, I was kind of wondering because I'm, I, I know I wasn't going to be in the theater. So I was like, how am I, am I going to be scared? I'll be, there, there's going to be such a distance. And, but then again, I also told myself, there's no hell, there's no hell, there's no way in hell I'm going to watch this in the dark um <laughs> because i do get scared <laughs> very easily unlike you i do get scared about with like even like when it's comedic and it's not supposed to be that scary i get scared you know i turn the lights on at night for a while like i remember watching women um was it woman in black mm. in theater and that was terrifying like i was scared for days and uh, i did for me that was like i think the only experience so far where i was really scared in 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 theater but with in, in in a play not in movies in movies i get super scared but this one i was a little bit scared to when because of her physicality when she was coming out of the well mm. and i think this ghost is i think she's known i think she's less scary because of her hair but i think of her physicality um i, I watched the ring, the ring before and i've i feel yeah the ring i didn't think i feel i didn't feel was that scary except for this yeah, sometimes it's silence that makes things scary as well. And I thought it did really well in the movie. But in, in this part, I still, yeah, it's just my imagination too. So at the end, I was a little bit scared during that part um, when she was coming out of the well. Yeah, that was really well handled. But I think oh. I would be super scared in a, in a mostly empty theater watching mm. that, I think. Yeah, you I know, think I think or that I'll might be have nervous turned, turned about like, is it going to be scary or am I going to get anxious? Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, we are over time a little bit, so I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone, very much for joining us. 
Oiwa, the ghost of Yotsuya, is still available on Sifa On Demand from now till the 20th of June 2021. Uh, you can check out the Sifa website for details on the show and the other shows available online. Arts Equator would like to thank the Arts House and Singapore International Festival of Arts for inviting us to be part of the program through the Asian Arts Media Roundtable. And for more information on the Asian Arts Media Roundtable, you can visit the Roundtable website for more details. Thank you all very, very much and goodbye.